Hey, good morning, all shalom, Sister Kate here. Uh, if you watched the last live stream, you know we've got big changes happening here on the mountain, and uh, I have been super, super busy. So I have not been able to get out my alone video, so here it is. I'm doing it this morning. Um, I believe I watched season six. I'll just name some of the people in it, and then that way you'll be able to identify uh, Barry, Jordan, Nathan, um, a woman named like Winota, uh, Nikki, um, oh, now that's about as many names as I can remember, but it's that season, I believe it's season six, they were in the Arctic, which, holy cow, you want a challenge? There you go, go up there and live like an Eskimo if you can, um, Oh, so what did I want to say about this whole thing? There were a lot of lessons to be learned with the people who were doing well. And even those people had their moments. So the 10 things, the 10 tips, the 10 observations I made about this particular season revolve around those things. What they may have done right, what they may have done wrong. So... Having given you that preface, let's get into it. The number one thing that stood out in this season to me was what people chose to use as a food source. Um, and make no mistake, these people in this season were survival experts. They were people who had had training these are people who knew their equipment, knew how to use it um, without revealing too much. Um, they knew what to do with their traps and their snares. The people who were going to fish had a plan and experience of fishing. So when you go to the Arctic, they're not going to put the bumbling newbies up there. These people knew what they were doing and they had taken decisions. Yeah, that's my plate. Remember I said I put the list on the plate? So... The people who decided to live by catching game, capturing game, whatever, caught game. They did. Uh, some of them were very efficient at it and, you know, caught game regularly. And they, they didn't end up winning. Although the one person, he caught both, right? But the difference was the people catching game, the game they could catch didn't have enough fat in the like a rabbit rabbit has protein but no fat and so you can starve to death eating just rabbits um so fishing was should have been was the main source for a lot of people because the fish had fat something else they didn't show and my daughter said well come on mom it's not very exciting to watch people eating plants but that there were most of the moss and the lichen in their area were edible and some of it had a lot of carbohydrate in it, which is, you know, good because it helps your body make fat. Um, and they only showed one person doing that. So I don't know if the other people were doing it, but they had spruce trees around them. Most of, you know, a spruce tree is edible. There were people making teas um, and they could have been making them from the plants. I don't know because I didn't specify that. But... Um, you want to make soups out of whatever you capture when you're in a situation like that. You do not want to waste any part of the animal or fish that you catch. Um, and for, I'm setting up a tripod, so give me a second. For a, a Torah observant person, that, that may be a little bit uh, catchy or whatever you want to call it. Maybe a little bit dicey because... Certain animals were not allowed to eat, and certain parts of the animal, like the kidney fat, were not allowed to eat. And the one guy was talking about how much kidney fat he had gotten off one of the animals he was able to take. And, uh, and the animals around him knew it, and they came and stole it. So not only is catching your food uh, something you have to think about, then you have to think about if you can um, preserve it. Because if you catch something big, you're going to have pounds and pounds of meat versus if you catch something small. So fish versus game, the people who fished and got game were the ones who did the best. And they all lost weight. All of them lost weight. A lot of weight. Okay, so that was point number one. Number two, uh, snares. 
most people ran a sn snares and multiple snares because you don't just want to count on one snare because it may not catch you anything. And um, the other thing they did right was if the snare wasn't working, they didn't leave it there and just hope something was going to come along. They studied the ground, noticed where the animals were traveling, and put the snares where the animals traveled. And that's how you do it. That's a smart way. And people who had snares out usually caught stuff in the snares. So that was really smart. Um, now, they, two people or three people wound up um, attracting foxes to their snares because they, you know, they don't check them every day and so they go out there and they've caught something. Well, the animals around, the predators around, n could smell that and would come take the uh, food out of the snare. And so one, one woman, very smart, um, she's like, oh, okay, so I need to trick, you know, make my snare so that it will, when it goes, it's gonna be up high in the air. That's the way to do it too, because if you get it high up in the air, then most ground traveling predators like the marten and the weasel and the fox can't climb the tree. And so she did that and then she was able to, you know, get more of her harvest. Um, something else of note, pretty much, now I'm not saying all of them, but pretty much everybody caught nothing in like the first week they were there. They basically just starved for a week while they're putting up their shelter, while they're walking around to find what's going on in their area, while they were gathering firewood and um, setting up snares and traps and everything like that. And that's something for you to think about. If you think you're gonna flee to the woods and then you're just gonna shoot the nearest deer that walks by, that's not the way it happens. It doesn't. Now, they were in the Arctic. So in your area, maybe there are other you know, game animals, grouse or ptarmigans or, or um, a more rabbits, more squirrels, more deer. But if you ask a hunter, it's not always as easy as just walking out in the woods and finding something. Sometimes you have to sit there quietly, not moving for hours to see the game. So just keep that in mind. If you ever have to flee to the woods, you may be starving for a week or even two especially if you're not prepared. If you don't bring something like a snare or a trap or they had bows or a firearm to help you gather the food, you may starve. That's why you want to know about plants. Um, as long as you are not having to flee in winter, summertime there's plenty of edible plants and fruit growing, nuts and things. So just keep it in mind. All right, number three. Oh no, that's that was number three. Uh, oh. The other thing about the starving was uh, the winner lost a pound a day for a month. Yeah, that's a lot of weight loss. And it also makes you weaker and your thought processes start to get a little jagged and you don't always make good decisions and you need to be aware of that so you can try to keep yourself on track. All right, so number four, uh, pretty much everybody was dehydrated. Now, <clears throat> in the Arctic, it becomes a problem to get water because even if you have a water source, like a creek or something, when it gets minus six degrees, it may not be running. And so you're gonna have to work for the water. You're gonna have to uh, crack ice and melt it or gather snow, which snow is not as efficient as ice because snow is like one eighth or one sixth of the volume um, of just water because it's got a lot of air in it. So if you get a big bucket of it, you're only gonna get like a sixth of the actual, you know, you get a gallon, you're only gonna get this much water out of it. Whereas if you can get a big old chunk of ice, it's mostly water. And so you're gonna get a lot more water out of it. Um, and you're definitely, they were all dehydrated. You could kind of tell by their skin um, and you could also tell by their lips, how dry their mouth was and stuff. So keep aware of that. And you can't just walk up to any stream, creek, anywhere and assume it's clean water. You've got to boil it or filter it. Um, and having uh, diarrhea and vomiting when you're already dehydrated is going to break you down. It's, it's really not a good thing. So you've got to stay hydrated. Number five. Um, I made this point already. The plants. I don't know if those people used the plants that were around them. It, they didn't show them doing it. But lots of plants in their area, 95% were edible. So it would be good for you to know wild edibles. All right, number six, 
um, accidents. Several of the people had accidents with their edged, you know, with their arrows, with their knives, with their hatchets, because they weren't being careful. You have to be careful when you're on the run because getting an infection or some sort of cut, the one person probably should have had stitches and it's an iffy proposition if a, you know, something open is going to heal correctly. It's a really easy way for an infection to happen. And so you've got to be careful and um, also have a first aid kit so you can deal with stuff if, if you know, yah forbid, you do end up injuring yourself. Um, some people fall. I think the one guy fell and broke a bone or possibly broke his ankle or something. I mean, it, it's important. It's important to watch where you're going and when you're using sharp tools or fire. Uh, I, sh yep, okay. I'm going to get to fire. You can hurt yourself. Just be careful. All right. Number seven is fire. I think three people set their shelters on fire. Now, the shelters were another thing. I don't know if I wrote that down there. I didn't. The shelters were another thing. Some people built some pretty daggone impressive shelters. Men and women did. Um, and then some people were, it was just kind of rudimentary. But the number one thing was... If you're going to have a fire inside, and they did because it's so cold up there, you're going to freeze to death if you don't, is to make that fire, fire safe. You know what I'm saying? I was going to say fireproof, but obviously, duh. Uh, you got to make it safe. And if it's inside your shelter, a lot of people put like a ring of stones around it. Awesome. So it's not going to catch, you know, anything immediately surrounding it, but they don't understand the heat. The heat coming up off the fire is going to go up to the ceiling and it's going to do things like dry the ceiling out above it, um, heat the ceiling above it up, and it will get to a point if you let that heat and smoke and everything gather long enough, the smoke can ignite itself. It, it, the smoke itself can ignite. Um, and if you've got, you know, you've got the stones and then you're supposed to have, I think, 18 inches between like a heat source and a wall. Our heat stuff had to be at least 18 inches away. If you've got it that close, that wall can be ignited just by the heat and the drying out. And all it takes is one spark to hit it and it will ignite. And so you've got to be very, very, if you're going to have fire, you need to be very, very careful with it. You need to be aware that not only is it heating what's around it, but the smoke coming off of it is, is hot. You also cannot run a fire in a completely airtight space because the carbon monoxide the fire's eating the oxygen, and when it eats all the oxygen up, then you have nothing to breathe in either, and you will breathe in carbon monoxide, which is a poison, and your body absorbs it faster than oxygen, so you can poison yourself with it pretty quickly. Um, so it's, yeah, you got to know what you're doing. You really, really do with fire. You, you, you do have to take precautions. So none of their shelters were airtight, and I'm sure they knew that. I'm sure they made sure that there was airflow at least a little so that they didn't poison themselves. Um, oh, I did put shelter, shelter's number eight. It all flows, right? But I wrote these things like three or four days. So anyway, um, yeah, the, there was a guy on there who was a Air Force survival instructor. That man built a shelter that you could use as an Airbnb. Um, I did watch another season of another guy who built a shelter, but gorgeous. Uh, made himself a little chess set. Uh, he made himself little toys and stuff, you know, little balls he could hit around. I think he golfed or something like that. They were doing awesome out there, and yet both of them quit because they missed their families. Um, and I can disagree with <clears throat> somebody missing their family that much, and they decide it's just not worth it. I don't want to sit out here for another month and starve. I'd rather go see my kitties or my wife, or my parents, or whatever. But it is something to take into account. Again, the mental side of the running and gunning and fleeing and hiding and everything, it's, it's a very big stressor to, to have to, you know, be uh, working so hard for your own survival. And so it, it's probably, uh, you might want to work on how, you know, techniques to calm yourself down techniques to gather your thoughts, techniques to make wise decisions, because number nine, we're flowing right into it. Um, 
the people who endured the longest were mentally flexible, meaning if something they had chosen, you know, I'm fishing a certain way or whatever, wasn't working, they would take a step back, reevaluate, and then move in a different direction. And that's really important because if you um, are doing something that's not working, you don't want to keep going at it until, you know, you finally realize, oh, this is not working. Uh, an example is one of the ladies was out on the ice and it was really thick. And she was just trying to dig herself a fishing hole because she knew she needed fish. And she had brought, I don't even know what tool, it looked like a tent stake to me. My husband said it was a saw. She didn't have a hatchet. Um, and she was just trying to dig herself a fishing hole on that ice. And she knew she was losing calories because it was a lot of work. And she's just, come on, come on. And she sat there for at least an hour. And, of course, didn't get anywhere near breaking through that ice. And I thought, for her, that was unusual. Because that uh, up to that point in the game, she had been taking really good decisions. She was a very skilled person. And I thought, why doesn't she stop and get some fire? Why doesn't she come out here and melt the ice? She obviously knows this is not working. But in that particular uh, situation, she just quit and went back to her shelter. So being flexible was the key to most people's endurance. To understand this pathway I've chosen is not being fruitful and I need to stop and I need to look at what's going around on around me and then take a decision to do something that is going to work. And it's really important when you're, you know, it's a survival situation. Your life could depend on it. So you've really got to keep mentally aware but mentally flexible. And um, number 10, I have adapt and have skills. So the, the, um, one of the contestants had done like a, a whole, um, like living in a foreign country, living with a foreign culture, uh, learning all the things that they knew and how to deal with their environment. And it really helped him in the Arctic environment. Um, he had the adaptability. He already knew because he had lived in the really cold weather, the things that he had to take care of. Um, yeah, and it kind of goes back to what I said on point number nine. I've got endure on number nine and adapt on number 10. So they kind of, you know, they, they, they go hand in hand. Um, and he had the worst adversity. And I, I know eh, it's really hard. I don't want to say a whole lot more about it, but um, some people had an easier time on there. He didn't, and yet he was able to, you know, adapt and overcome. So I don't want to get into it more than that, but it, it, it was an excellent season to learn lessons for survival type things. And I know that, oh, duh, Sister Kate, so was season one. But see, I don't think season one was in the Arctic. It was in Vancouver or somewhere. Um, but f number one, main point, whole overarching, every one of them was near water. Some of them were in locations, three sides surrounded by water. I think if you've got that much water, you definitely fish, right? I mean, it just makes sense. Okay, uh, yeah, and on that topic, some of those guys, man, they made lures out of tin cans that they found. They knew what the fish were going to like, and when they used their lures, they got fish. Man, so maybe we all need to do a little bit more uh, brushing up on our fishing skills. All right, thanks for coming along, y'all. I got to go. Bless y'all. Shalom.